quite, a, quite an honor for me to, to stand here and present to you the results of an almost two-year-long legislative work which was grounded in extensive debates, consultation with stakeholders, member states, and the European institutions. The initial promise was to deliver on a Europe that protects, which in practice also means strengthening the resilience of the critical systems underpinning our way of life and our internal market. And today with the CER directive, the EU is in a position to deliver on that promise. Before we vote, let me just have a brief overview of what has transpired in Europe while we were been working on this file, which also provides the strongest arguments for why the European Union needs a new piece of legislation to better protect its critical entities. Right before the Commission rolled out its, its draft, the COVID pandemic broke out, infecting and killing millions of Europeans and disrupting our health care, our economy and our societies. Later, while we were negotiating this law or this directive, Russia launched its brutal attack, brutal aggression against Ukraine. And since then, the European Union has been facing an unprecedented increase of sabotage operations on its critical infrastructure from the energy sector to transport services or experiencing uh, an increasing number of hybrid attacks on its public institutions. And in the meantime, the climate crisis has been burning and flooding our continent from Greece to Portugal, Sweden to Italy. And all of these crises, all of these events have also served as sort of a compass for the co-legislators as they were fine-tuning this directive. Now more than ever, we must prove to our citizens that the European Union protects their lives, protects their jobs, their companies, the essential services that affects the daily lives of our citizens and eventually the entire European Union. Therefore, our ambition with this directive is to strengthen the ability of critical entities to cope with these risks to their operations while improving the functioning of the internal market in these essential services. There are 11 crucial sectors covered and this directive addresses the various measures and requirements that its implementation, so that its implementation will adequately respond to both natural catastrophes and man-made attacks. And I trust that our joint compass throughout this process has brought solid rules and establishes the cooperation, coordination and information flows among the member states, among the entities and the European Commission, which will strengthen the preparedness for these incidents and the response to these incidents and eventually its evaluations. Because resilience is not just about preventing a risk because a disaster can always occur. The crucial thing is how we cope with that and how we, as European Union, bounce back from it. Moreover, this is reflected in the legislation, there are entities which have a pan-European dimension because they operate simulta simultaneously in several member states. Uh, and risk to their operations is therefore a risk for the single market as a whole. And this directive then puts a special focus on these entities and on the cross-border cooperation uh, of them of these entities which are of part, uh, particular European significance. Finally, uh, I would say I'm delighted that our mutual work, and this is thanks to you, Madam Commissioner, thanks to my colleagues, shadow advisors, uh, or shadow rapporteurs, advisors in the European Parliament, and our counterparts in the Council, have resulted in what I believe is the best possible legislation. It is a big step for the European Union, and I really hope that this Parliament will broad, broadly support it by adopting our interinstitutional agreement later today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the discussion and thank you for the support. It is quite rare that uh, there is such a broad consensus uh, in this parliament from the left to the, to the right, and not just a consensus and agreement on, on this text that is going to be voted later on, but also a consensus and an agreement on the kind of threats that we face and on the kind of actions that we need to take. Uh, I note that uh, uh, a lot of you colleagues have, uh, have approved of the expansion of the sectors that will be covered in this directive to 11. I'm also uh, happy that there's a strong agreement on that. I should also mention uh, that 
uh, highlight that the philosophy of this directive is somewhat different from the last one, and I appreciate that. I think this is, all, uh, this is also where, where, where there's a consensus that we're moving from just protecting particular pieces of critical infrastructure, assets and buildings and what, whatnot, that we're moving to a philosophy where we're focusing on the resilience of those essential services. And I think this reflects this new, new and dangerous world that, uh, that we're entering where the risks can't all be eliminated. There will be threats, there will be incidents, uh, and, and we need to be clear with our citizens that not with this directive, not with anything we can do, can we eliminate all the risks flowing from natural catastrophes to war to hybrid sabotage attacks. What we can do, though, is to minimize those risks and to make sure that when incidents happen, we are prepared and our entities, be they public or private, are able to bounce back and carry on with the services that are essential for our societies and for our single market. And this is what this directive does. This is, this is what it's for. And with its approval and with its implementation, uh, the European Union, its citizens, its single market will be all the more secure. So let me again thank so much to the Commission, to the French Presidency, to all my colleagues uh, from, from the political groups. Uh, and I would just reiterate the call of the Commissioner to member states to implement this as swift as possible. Thank you so much.